And just like that, it was all a bad dream. My channel was remonetized. Thank you all so, so, so much for speaking out on my behalf and getting YouTube's attention in this situation. You have no idea what a wave of relief I feel right now. Every day I'm so thankful for how blessed I am to have all of your unwavering support. And now, as if nothing happened, let's get right into the stories. Years ago, when I was still a teenager, my friend Justin and I would go longboarding at night, as my friends and I were quite the night owls. We loved the freedom of almost never seeing another soul on the roads or the paths we frequented. Even when using main roads, it would be very rare to see a car out so late in such a rural area, and you could see and hear them coming from very far away due to their headlights and the noise of the vehicle disrupting the peaceful silence of the night. We were really into it at the time and would often ride our boards for miles and miles, sometimes not arriving home until the sun was up. One particular night we decided to ride a few miles away from our usual back roads to take one of our favorite hidden routes. It began with a narrow paved path that was the only piece of land separating two sides of a long lake. It would often sink under due to rain and we wanted to seize the opportunity to use it before it rained and went underwater again. It was roughly two miles long and was extremely relaxing to ride through due to the scenery. After making it to the end of the lake, we decided to continue moving and turn into a very close path that leads directly into a densely wooded wilderness preservation. As we come up to the first hill, we looked down at the bottom into the blackness. We both noticed what appeared to be a tiny, moving ball of dim light down there. It moved so strangely and it was extremely difficult to make out what it was. Rather than shine our flashlight down, we curiously watched it for a few moments, whispering to each other about what it could possibly be. All at once, that small light turned into multiple blinding lights and extremely loud revving sounds, overwhelming our senses that had become accustomed to the dark and silence. Acting purely on fear, we instantly turned around and ran as fast as we could, hearing yelling and revving gaining behind us. By sheer luck, we managed to run off the path into a very dark, very overgrown hole in the side of a hill overlooking where we had just come from. We decided to hide in the natural dugout of this hill, hoping the plants and darkness would be enough to protect us from whatever was happening out there. We watched our pursuers ride up to where we had originally been standing. There were four men, two on four-wheelers and two on full-size motorcycles. They were yelling at each other about something, but... We couldn't make out what they were saying due to the distance we had covered. We felt safe enough to whisper very softly to each other and speculated who these people could be. Our first thought was they might be park rangers of some kind, although we had never seen one here in the many years we had been through and, honestly, we doubted that this county had this budget or even the desire to have anyone patrol the deep woods at night. Besides that, these men were on vehicles entirely inappropriate for the paved bike trails, and they were very angry about something. They called out to us for a while, yelling things like, We know you're out there, and we can see you, come on out. We stayed silent and decided to call their bluff instead of running. Eventually, we heard one of the men yell, Find them now, and smash a bottle. That had erased any hope we had that these were just park rangers, we watched them split up, each of them going a different way down the series of paths on their vehicles, including the path we came from. It took us what felt like ages to even move. We were frozen in terror inside that dugout, watching the lights from the vehicles travel through the woods and paths, one of them already coming full circle and passing the point he started from. I thought about calling for help, but I was too afraid to open my phone in fear that even the smallest amount of light would give away our location. After waiting for the lights of the vehicles to reach their farthest distance yet, we finally summoned the nerve to get up and try to run somewhere far enough for these people to safely make a call. We ran as hard and fast as we could through the woods. Since their headlights gave away their location on these paths, we would hide again whenever we felt that they were getting too close. 
Our available hiding spots were getting progressively worse as the woods became less dense, and the fear I felt waiting for one of them to drive past us while basically only being covered in leaves and plants may still be unmatched to this day. Finally, we emerged from the woods onto the intersection of two main roads far from where we started. We ducked down into the ditch to call for help. When I opened my phone, I noticed I had recently missed calls from one of our other friends, Connor, who was supposed to meet up with us on our longboard excursion. I called him and frantically asked where he was. Muck was with us again. He hadn't given up on our plans despite us ignoring him and was only a few miles away, already heading in our direction. I gave him the names of the two streets we were near the corner of and explained that we needed to be picked up right away. He agreed to speed over to us while Justin and I waited in hiding. Thankfully, Connor arrived before any of those men did. We bolted into the back seats of his car, yelling for him to get out of there, and he took off. Relief doesn't begin to describe what I felt safely driving home after everything I had just experienced. After explaining everything that happened to Connor, we ended up just moving on with our night and decided not to call the police. We figured they would be gone by the time any officer made it out there and that we would only be putting ourselves at risk by admitting to breaking the law by taking those paths so late at night. I still have no idea what happened or who those people were. I've been told all kinds of theories from friends and family that have heard this story. Some think we walked right up into a huge drug deal. Justin and I later admitted to each other that when the revving started and we couldn't see, our minds both went straight to chainsaw-wielding horror movie serial killer, so I suppose it could have been much worse. Frustratingly enough, whatever those men thought we saw that made them want to catch us so badly, we never actually saw. We'll never really know, I suppose. I live in a small city not too far from Edmonton and recently there's been a series of armed robberies happening in and around the area. It made me wary about walking alone at night so I found myself home at night more often than usual. It's not the worst but I dislike having this feeling of unease but I manage and make do. Today my dad and his girlfriend were invited to go out to a party meaning I had the whole house to myself. I pretty much had the evening planned out, watch some episodes of my favorite soap opera, then switch over to some classic horror films. So I said bye to them as they left and quickly loaded up the TV. It's not long after I had started up the horror movie that I heard a knock at the door. It wasn't a regular knocking. If my TV had been any louder, I probably wouldn't have been able to hear it. Thinking it was nothing at first, I went over to the door without pausing the movie just to confirm but to my surprise, there was someone at the door. I opened the door and there stood a slim man. He looked to be in his mid-thirties and that's all I can pretty much say. I'm not the best when it comes to describing people and I didn't really go out of my way to analyze him at that moment. I couldn't even tell you if his jacket was gray or black. The man said he represented a security company and was going around my area to offer his company services. He asked if the owner of the house was home, to which I told him no, and that he would not be home until late. He then began giving me some quick information about his company, that it was the only one that was locally funded, and that it's already being used in several homes in my street, and that it's smart device friendly. He even showed me a laminated piece of paper that displayed all the different devices that could work with the security system. I told him that we weren't interested in having a security system at this time, he proceeded to ask if my family leaves the house for long trips, which would be a great reason to get the security system. Looking back now, this was a huge red flag, but I answered honestly that the house was almost never empty and that we never really went on trips. I also added that he could speak to my dad tomorrow if he was coming back. He told me his team would be leaving to another city tomorrow, thanked me for my time, and then left. I went back to my movie and pretty much forgot about the visitor. Movie finishes and I decide to check my Facebook to glance the buy and sells. Near the top of my feed is a shared post that caught my eye immediately. 
what I read next made me completely freeze up. It was from a woman who also talked to a representative from the exact security company I had been advertised. This guy knocked on her door softly too, which immediately caught my attention. She noted how the guy never gave his name or business card, something I didn't even realize happened for me until I thought back on it. Overall, she was very suspicious of the guy, so she asked that he wait outside as she got a pen and paper to write down his phone number. When she returned, he was gone. The next door neighbor told her that they saw the man running down the road and into an alley. But the biggest fact this woman dropped? She contacted the security company. It does actually exist. And they told her that they didn't send anyone out to this city to go door to door. This shared post is blowing up and it seems that it occurred to a lot more people than just me. Some people even showed video from their security cameras of these employees. There's definitely more than one person pretending to work for this company, one even being a woman, and a lot of strange activity being reported. One person going into the backyard without permission, another person standing in front of the house like they're scoping it out. Knowing all of this now, it makes the entire encounter with that guy at my door terrifying. Was he scoping my house too? Would he have tried something if I didn't answer? I also wonder, was he hesitant to try anything because I didn't pause my movie? For all he knew, I could have had a friend over. Luckily, nothing suspicious happened for the rest of the night, but I will be extremely cautious from now on. If there's one thing I would advise, be suspicious of anyone you don't know that comes to your house. Just because someone says they work for a company doesn't make it true. You don't know who they are or what they might actually want from you. Three years ago, I met, who is now my best friend, Kay, through working in a restaurant. We immediately found that we had similar interests. Oh, you're a girl that likes gaming? Word, let's hang out. We were about 21 and 22 at the time. Fast forward to our first day hanging out outside of work. We go to a brewery downtown because we shared the similar craving for this thing on the menu called crack fries. They're seasoned to absolute perfection and tossed in truffle oil. Would recommend 10 out of 10. We had some beers, talked about school, and eventually decided to check out what events were going on in the park circle downtown while we sobered up. The park circle had different events going on throughout the week. Swing dancing on Tuesdays, jazz on Wednesdays. It was Wednesday and I wanted to check if the jazz event was in season. Ah, shoot. I glanced to the circle to what appeared to be a church event. It's not for another month. The church event was playing this chill and ambient instrumental music. The weather finally crept its way up to 70 degrees and sunny. We decided to stay, pitch up a hammock, and enjoy the artsy musical culture our city holds in the park circle. Kay had never hammocked before or seen the events in the circle, so I was pretty stoked to share what would be a new experience for her. We're facing each other, sharing stories from our past, tugging at the ropes to rock the hammock back and forth. It's a great first friend date. We're laughing, just two peas in a pod looking up at the finally blue sky of springtime, watching the sunlight flitter through the treetops overhead until the greasy, cracked-out face of a man hovers into our vision. Looks like fun. Mind if I join you? He uninvitedly plops his backpack against the tree holding our hammock strap. Uh... We exchange an unsettled glance and immediately sat upright to face the man. It's broad daylight and homeless people sometimes meander towards the circle and sat under the shaded trees to just hang out. Some asked for money, but most kept to themselves. Nothing out of the ordinary. I was kind of creeped out by the guy, but didn't think much of it because I'm used to interactions with homeless people. My mother was homeless, so I guess you could say I have a soft spot for having a conversation about their life, not giving them money, maybe offering a cigarette, and leaving it at that. Kay hasn't had that experience, so she keeps glancing back at me for some support of what we should do. The guy decides that he's welcome, cracks open a 40 in a crinkled paper bag and takes a few swigs. 
he extends his can to offer us some. We decline and ask him what he's doing. Just seeing what's going on downtown. Notice a large group down there. He points a dirty stub of a fingernail out to the circle. Saw you set up and thought this uh, swingy thing looked cool. I already considered saying, oh, we were just leaving, but he watched us set up. Getting up and packing up now after being there only 10 to 20 minutes only would indicate fear. Kay raises an eyebrow at me. I'm fairly new to the whole hammocking thing, so I'm trying to quickly devise how to casually grab my hammock, what excuse sounds most believable to make an exit and get right out of there. He gives the typical creeper interview questions, where are you from, what are you doing? We give him short replies, hoping maybe he'll take a hint and go bother somebody else. He only gets closer. What's this? He starts rocking our hammock. Kay's eyes cut into mine with panic. A hammock? Where do you buy him? Thinking about getting one of my own. Maybe this guy genuinely wants to buy a hammock and is socially inept, not realizing rocking two girls in a hammock is incredibly creepy. I look down to the circle. Everyone's just doing their church thing. I look towards the walking paths that spiral out from the circle. I give passerbys a wide-eyed look of please help us. They exchange this same look of, well, that's creepy. Sucks to be you girls and continue walking. I look to the other side of the road and see a strange construction van pull up, the plate obscured. There was no business information on the side, but then again, my uncle drives a similar van for work. I expect to see a construction worker come out, but it's a man dressed in a business casual talking on a cell phone. We'll call him BC for business casual guy. The homeless man nods his head at BC who starts slowly and casually making his way towards us while maintaining his conversation. BC is speaking in a different language. I assume it's Hindi because I had a friend, Andrea, who grew up half Indian with her native speaking grandma and her father. By her family's interactions, I could usually tell when something serious was going down. Family, money issues, etc. Sometimes I'd pick up small words in their conversations and try to understand what they meant. I was studying French in college at the time and learned that once you study a language, it can become pretty universal. You don't understand just that language, you can pick up on similar sounding vowels and words which hold a pretty similar meaning. From that, you can kind of decipher a translation. From BC's body language and words, how he kept looking towards us with purgatory eyes, I felt completely hollowed out. And then the feeling of a lead weight sank in my chest when I heard him say, Do Ladakh. In a Hindi to French to English conversion that my brain puzzled together, Do is similar to Do is similar to Tu. Ladakh, rest of word cut out, was pronounced in a way that reminded me of what Andrea's grandma called us when we were in middle school, before she translated her broken English and said, Girls. BC discreetly motioned towards us. I take out my cell phone and bring up an old text, pretending I just got it. Hey Kay, uh, looks like Chris and Jordan are here. They're looking for us right now. I throw my body off the hammock, unclip it from the loop and swiftly pull the hammock straps from the tree. Kay never took a hammock down before but learned very quickly. We threw the jumbled heap of hammock and its straps in my backpack and the homeless man calls after where are you going? We swiveled into a crowd of people and when I turn, I see the homeless man in BC speaking, motioning angrily back towards us. We scramble through the crowds of people and down a few side streets until we're out of sight. Later, we tell my aunt and uncle when we get to my house. By the way, this is my friend Kay and here's what happened. My aunt's eyes are cold and she tells us that trafficking and abductions of young women have been on the rise in our city, pulling women into vans from the side of the road or using markers of objects or people to indicate targets. We were a very visible target, sitting nearby a street in a highlighter yellow hammock. Now to the creepy business casual dude driving a work van and homeless guy who probably scored a natural ice for keeping us distracted. 
Nice try. So this happened two years ago this summer. I was 16, turning 17 soon. At the time, I had a babysitting gig for the summer, a job at the local gym by my house, and walked everywhere in my town, as I did not have my license yet. In general, it is a small, safe town in California. This day started off like normal, me walking to the kid's house, the mom going over instructions for the day. She liked having me do activities with the kids in town, like swimming, going to the park, just generally being active and not hanging around the house all day. On this day, I took them on a long walk, and then we stopped at a subway for lunch around 1 p.m. As we were finishing, their mom texted me and said that she was done with work early and said I could meet her a few stores down at Starbucks. We walked down, and I dropped the kids off with her, ordered a drink, and left around 2.30 p.m. I began walking to a park about three-fourths of a mile to one mile away to meet with another mom I was going to potentially babysit for as well. About a block down from Starbucks, there is a Safeway. Right as I began passing Safeway's parking lot, a guy flung his door open and hopped out of his car, parked above the sidewalk. This guy looked to be about late 20s, maybe early 30s, taller than me, about 5'11", 6 foot, and messy hair with a thick beard. He flagged me down and said, Hey, I'm new in town. Now, like I stated, this is normally a safe town, the kind you would want to raise a family in or retire in at first. I didn't want to be rude, so I said, Oh, cool. No red flags were going off yet. As being a naive 16-year-old girl, I figured that it was safe to be friendly for a couple of seconds and keep going on my way because of where I live. Then he abruptly asked, Since I'm new here and don't know anyone yet and you seem like a nice girl, you want to hop in and show me around? Red flag number one. I quickly replied, Sorry, can't do that for you, I'm busy. I figured he would take the hint. He says, Oh, come on now, I'm, I'm not a creep, I'm like 29. How old are you, 18, 19? And began looking around us and fidgeting with his hands and pockets. Red flag number two. No, I'm sorry, I'm 17. You can go find some people your age down that street over there. I lied about my age because I was getting nervous at this point and didn't want to give him my actual age. Also, I was really hoping he would take the hint when I pointed him in the direction of the bars down the street I pointed to people his own age to talk to. He stuttered and said, Uh, actually, I'm 20. I was just kidding about being older. He laughed and looked around again. Come on, just get in the car. It'll be fun. I'm not that much older. His voice took a more serious and persistent tone. Red flag number three. At this point, I felt really scared and just wanted to get away from him, so I quickly shook my head and began walking away. I looked behind me to see if he was following me, only to see him getting in his car. I felt relieved and thought pretty stupidly that he was going down the street. A girl, probably a couple years older than me, caught up to me to check on me, as she had witnessed and heard everything. She asked if I needed help and if I wanted to call the police. I said, Thanks, but I shook him, so I'll be fine. I appreciated her looking out for me, but I did not feel that I was in danger anymore. I still kicked myself for not calling the police when she had offered. After passing a gas station, I saw his car come flying down the next street. He stopped in the middle of the crosswalk, blocking me from crossing. He rolled down his window and began harassing me. Hey girl, when you turn in 18, huh? When are you turning 18? Come on, we're gonna have some fun, girl. We don't need to wait till you're 18. You can just come with me now and we'll have some fun. You're a cute girl. Come on now. You got a nice body. He said all of this with an evil, sickening grin. I was in full panic mode and didn't even think at this point. I ran around the front of his car into the street, then back on the sidewalk on the other side and ran down the sidewalk. I looked behind me to see him speeding in the other direction. I slowed down again and called my mom. I told her everything that had just happened and she insisted on picking me up and driving me to my destination. I agreed. 
So when I'm at the stoplight just under a fourth a mile away from the park, I see him driving down the street again. He drove by me slowly, still wearing that sickening grin and winking at me before speeding off again. I called my mom, freaking out. So of course, after she picked me up, we called the police on the way to the park. The police officer pulled in right around the same time as us at the park. So I got out of the car to go give my statement on what had happened and give a description of the man in his car. He also asked if I managed to get a license plate number. Unfortunately, I only got the first few numbers and letters and not the whole plate. He informed me and my mother that he would be going back to the station to file a report. Against the officer and my mom's suggestions, I stayed at the park as I did not want to make a bad impression on someone I was potentially babysitting for. She arrived after my mom and the officer left. Immediately after the interview, I had my dad pick me up because there was no way I was walking home. The officer contacted me later that night, saying that I got a potential match for the vehicle I described with the partial plate number I gave them. However, nothing ever came of it. Since the incident, I've been carrying self-defense items, alarms, pepper spray, on my keychain. I don't ever leave my house without something to protect myself. After I got my license, I haven't been walking around town that much, even if I'm with my friends or boyfriend, which is sad because it is a beautiful town. I'm now 18 years old and I'm still haunted by what had happened. Whenever I see a similar car or a similar guy, I panic a little, even in the safety of my own car. To this day, I honestly don't know what I was thinking every time I thought he was gone for sure. I guess part of me was really hoping that he had just left. I thought I'd share something that happened to me when I was pretty young. It's not as scary as other things on here, but I still think about it now, maybe 16 years later. I was on my way home from elementary school. I don't know exactly how old I was, but I know I didn't have a cell phone yet, which puts me at about 11 or under, probably a couple of years younger. My class had ended very early that day, something I was very happy about. I always liked to be alone as a child and not having to share the whole house with my parents or several siblings, even for a couple of hours, was very exciting for me. However, because of this, I was completely alone on my way home for a while. When the car first showed up, I was already on edge. I was on the midway point on my journey home, which meant I was right by the abandoned house my older siblings had told me was haunted. I was always afraid of suddenly spotting a face in one of the dark windows or something, and I kept an eye out for anything just in case. So when a car I'd never seen before suddenly sped past me down the hill I was climbing, I jumped. This is an area of very steep hills. You can't see past them, so it's too dangerous to drive that fast. I felt unsafe for a second before writing it off as nothing before the same car sped up the hill again. I thought it was funny at first, imagining the person in the car had sped off in a hurry but had to turn right back around because of something forgotten. When the car came back down again, it drove a lot slower, until it got to me, and then drove a lot slower creeping past me at a snail's pace. I didn't look at the person driving, not wanting to be rude. Once it was about a meter away from me, it drove fast again. It threw me off, but I decided not to worry about it. Maybe the person driving just really wanted to make sure they wouldn't hit me with their car. I had only gotten a little further before it was back again. Slow again this time when it got close to me and speeding up once it had passed me, even though... I was almost in a ditch trying to stay out of the road. I was definitely spooked now. In my short life, this has never happened to me before. Was this some sort of strange adult showing me some kind of interest? And why? If this person needed directions, he would have asked by now, right? I could not come up with an explanation for this behavior, unless... unless this adult had some bad intent. But I felt bad for just assuming that of a stranger... When the car came towards me once more, I got my first look at this person. A man, very overweight, bald but wearing a baseball cap. He had small sunglasses on his face that somehow hid his entire expression. Stubble, 
a white t-shirt with blue or black decals on it. For a split second I thought it was the father of a friend of mine, another very large man, but my friend's father sported a full beard and never dressed like that. He also kind of looked like a distant uncle of mine so I half-heartedly decided that was the case and tried to smile at him once he started creeping slowly by me. No reaction of his face that I could see, he had those glasses on. He didn't stop, didn't open his window to say hi, didn't acknowledge me at all, just drove by so, so slowly until he passed me and sped up. I still could not justify this behavior in my head, I mean what did he want from me? So I needed to get away. There was a small trail through some trees I knew of that would take me away from the road and pretty much straight home, a little while ahead. A good shortcut if you wanted to climb a very steep hill. The car kept coming, kept snailing by me and in the short minutes I had in between when he was turning his car somewhere, unable to see me, I ran to reach that trail until I was in sight again. I was afraid of running while he saw me, afraid it might escalate the situation, that he might come out of the car and start chasing me for real, and I couldn't run very fast. So I tried to seem unafraid and walked at a leisurely pace, which was probably stupid of me. At one point, I pretended to fish a phone out of my pocket and talk to someone on it when he could see me, hoping it would deter the man. But it probably didn't look like a phone. I was just holding a handful of old candy wrappers and my keys from my pocket. I gave up on that plan quickly. Unfortunately, once I could see the trail, the car was back, very close to me. At this point, I noticed the car kept driving on the wrong side of the road, as close to me as possible. I figured if I tried for the trail, I might stumble or not climb it fast enough and he just grabbed me. Defeated, I had to walk past my shortcut and the car, pretending to assume nothing, but then the car came to a full stop and so did I. He just stopped there in the middle of the hill next to the trail, car facing away from me. I tried to read this action. Was he waiting for me to do something? I tried to search the part of the man's face I could see in his side mirror. Nothing. I don't know how long both of us stood there before I decided to walk again, but this time backwards facing the car. The only thing I could imagine he might be doing was waiting for me to drop my guard so I didn't drop it. I held my keys as tight as I could in my pocket while slowly walking backwards, staring at his face in the mirror. When I had gotten a decent number of steps away, the car started rolling down the hill again. I waited until I was just out of sight before I darted back to the shortcut. If he kept following me up the road, he'd definitely find out which house I lived in, and I couldn't risk that. My heart had never beaten as fast as it did when I scrambled up that trail. I didn't stop to look behind me or even breathe before I had reached my house. I fumbled with my keys in the lock while I frantically looked around for the car, locked myself in as fast as I could and sprinted to my younger sister's bedroom window, where I could see some of the road. I saw the car coming back up the hill and then back down and out of sight. I stood at that window for over an hour and the car never came back up again. When my dad came home I asked if our uncle was in town visiting but he was confused at the very idea. I didn't tell my parents about this car incident until very recently. At that age I was still thinking there might be a small chance that it was a friend of one of my parents that I didn't recognize and that accusing him of being a potential kidnapper would be an unforgivable offense. I had weird priorities back then. I can't say for certain that I haven't seen this man since. Bald, fat men aren't exactly a rarity where I live and the car was pretty anonymous. I've had somewhat severe anxiety since adolescence to this day, and slow-moving cars can still trigger some pretty bad anxiety attacks. This story happened about two years ago when I was sharing an apartment with a roommate. It was a fairly quiet apartment complex in a relatively safe area. I have a small cat that is at my apartment. I am inexperienced with people and socially awkward, so I fail to recognize lots of red flags. I'm in my apartment on my weekend off from work, and my roommate is at work on the night shift. I have very weird sleeping hours, so it's not odd for me to do chores and other things at night. 
I had done the laundry in the wee hours of the night plenty of times, and I never felt bothered doing so. I'm debating how to bring our laundry to the laundry building because the wheels in our laundry basket broke. The problem with this is that both of us have been procrastinating, so the laundry began to pile up. I am not strong by any means, so I'm trying to think of how to manage this decidedly heavy buildup of clothing. I decide to stuff a bunch of clothes into the broken laundry basket and put some in garbage bags. I manage to stuff two garbage bags with clothes and resolve to drag the laundry basket first and come back for the two bags. It's only a five minute walk to the laundry building from my room. The first two trips for the wash cycle go off without a hitch, but I am exhausted and the laundry basket bottom is shredded to oblivion. I decide I can't drag it again or it'll get torn through completely. I make my second trip to put the clothes in the dryer, then walk back to my apartment so I can chill until they're done. So far so good, nothing weird at all. Time flies and it's time to pick up the laundry. So I head off, taking some garbage bags with me to haul the first load back. It's around 2 a.m. As I get to the laundry building, I start feeling uneasy. I glance around and see no one, but for some reason my nerves are fraying. My hands start shaking and I fumble the keys in the door and go in. I look out the window and see no one. So I chastise myself for freaking out over nothing and manage to stuff everything into three garbage bags. I stand there and consider if I want to make two trips, but that feeling kept nagging me, so I decided to roll up my sleeve and flex some muscles to get it done in one go. With two bags in my right hand and a third tossed over my left shoulder, I booty bump my way out of the door. When I go outside, I immediately begin feeling nervous again. I look around but see no one. No idling cars, no people on any of the lit sidewalks, not a single soul. I start heading to my apartment but realize it's all much heavier than I bargained for and my right hand begins hurting as the bag ties begin cutting into my hand. I set the bags down, flex my hand and try to find a more comfortable way to grab them. I also notice one bag is beginning to rip. As I do this I suddenly get a huge wave of panic and I instinctively look around but I see no one again. Just as I'm beginning to think I'm just being paranoid. A guy in all black suddenly seems to just melt out of the shadows of two nearby cars directly to my right. I notice him from my right peripheral and I almost jump out of my skin. I didn't hear him coming at all. He laughs and apologizes for spooking me and says, I happen to be biking by and it looks like you're having a hard time with that. Let me help. I have never really gotten alarm bells before even seeing a person, so... I err on the side of caution. Oh no, it's okay, I got it. I'm not that far from here. Just down the sidewalk, actually. He stoops down and picks up the two bags I set down and says, Even better, I live that way too. I hesitate. I don't want to be rude, but for some reason my fight or flight is kicking in. My desire not to be rude overtakes and I laugh awkwardly. He starts walking off with my laundry almost like he knows where he's headed. I keep apologizing and telling him he really doesn't have to do this and asking if he's really okay heaving those heavy bags. He assures me he's fine and makes no further comments. He walks so fast I almost have to jog to keep up behind him. Eventually after passing three other intersections he stops at the only turn leading toward my apartment and stops in front of my door before I even get there and says, All right. Where should I put them? I'm a little concerned he knew where I lived, but said, oh, Right here by the door's fine. He stands there and just sort of stares at me and I stare back. Feeling awkward, I open my apartment, go in and put my bag down near the door. When I turn around, I jump out of my skin a second time as I almost turn right into him. He had followed me inside. He's still holding my laundry and looking around the apartment and then he spots my cat. She's a very cute cat. What type of cat is that? She's a blue Russian, right? He asks, still holding my laundry. I've seen her looking through the window a lot. I'm way past creeped out by this point, and I don't know how to get this guy to leave. My apartment was right by the property line hedge on the corner of the building on the first floor. The only way he could have seen her would be to walk by my door regularly, 
which wouldn't be weird in and of itself until later. I shrugged awkwardly and say I don't know what she is. He then sets the bags down in the middle of the living room floor and tries to pet her, but she runs away. He shrugs at me and comments that he didn't think she'd be skittish. I kind of stare at him uncomfortably and he slowly backpedals his way to the door with a smile. Well, uh, anyway, he says, you have a nice night, ma'am. Glad you got home safe, but it's time for me to head home. I watched him go and watched him walk back the way he came. Me wanting to confirm my suspicion, I pretended to close my door behind him, count to ten, and then go out to see where he went. I watched him walk to the adjacent apartment building and go up the stairs to wherever his apartment was up there. No way he could have seen my cat. There is no way, aside from him simply coming by my door, for no reason. Last year, a friend Julie and I decided to go backpacking in a North Carolina section of the Appalachian Mountains. It was a relatively remote mountain trail with a Boy Scout camp at the base. We were planning on hiking the length of the trail from one side of the mountain to the other, which was supposed to take about four days. We drove separately to the mountain and Julie beat me to the parking area of the trail, which consisted of a dirt road right next to a creek. There were three other cars parked, including hers. I met up with her and we started hiking up the approximately 3,000 feet to the summit at around 3 p.m. I had backpacked two times before and camped about three times before this. I was pretty young each time and someone else was in charge of researching the area we were in, basically checking the weather for the time we'd be there and what the camping area was like. But this time I was the one who had decided where to hike. I didn't look at the weather or what was going on with the trail at the time just that it looked beautiful and like a fun trek. Julie was quite experienced with backpacking. She used to work for a company that led school kids on Appalachian trail trips and was the reason I trusted her as my backpacking partner. She had looked up the weather and the status of the trail. Apparently, we were in for thunderstorms for the week. On top of that, the accomplice in an unresolved homicide case was last seen on this trail. Stupidly, I wasn't too put off by this. As we hiked up the mountain, we passed what I now know were the owners of the other cars in the parking lot at the base of the trail. A woman and a man who were walking their adorable dog, a man with a fully equipped backpack, didn't think much about it at the time, and another man who had hiking sticks and seemed to be just out for a day hike. At around 5pm we were exhausted because the trail was pretty much straight up. We found ourselves in a relatively open area close to the summit and decided to set up camp. Despite the area being cleared, no one was around besides a few campfires that had been there for a while because the last rains had been about a week ago. We set up our tents, then went to find firewood. Twenty feet up the mountain from our camp, there was an apparently abandoned tent. We ignored it at first because we didn't want to be rude. Eventually, we realized that there was no one else around. I decided to look inside the otherwise pristine tent. The rain fly wasn't on, so I peered inside one of the ventilation flaps. Inside was a wet sock, three cliff bar wrappers, and an unused condom. Weird, but no one was around, so we ignored it. We ate dinner, tied our bear bag, and went to sleep. As soon as I zipped my tent door closed, rain started to fall. I'm not going to lie, I'm not the most acclimated to sleeping on a flat, hard surface, so my night was characterized by periodic moments of restlessness to readjust. It was pitch black, so it was difficult to determine whether I was dreaming or awake. During the night, I thought I heard two people come up the trail from the direction Julie and I had come. They stopped about ten feet away from our campsite, whispered to each other, then one of them walked through our camp. The next morning I woke up surprisingly well rested. As we were eating breakfast I told Julie about my dream. She told me it couldn't have been a dream because she experienced the same thing. That's when I noticed the footprints through our camp. Naturally we went to the location of the mysterious tent from the day before and it was still there. We continued our hike to the summit in the rain that hadn't stopped from the night before. 
The summit's portion of the trail was impassable due to overgrowth, so we went back to our cars and left. All I'm left wondering is why two people would hike up 2,900 feet of difficult trail in the pitch blackness of night without flashlights. This happened to my best friend's father, Matt, who was like a father to me. Leela, my best friend, and I can't be sure if these are the exact dates and time as Matt refuses to talk about this, and we heard this from Greg, her uncle, his brother, a few years ago. From what we do know, though, this would have taken place sometime during the 90s or very early 2000s, as it happened a few years before Leela was born in 2004. Matt would have been around in his mid-twenties, living in an apartment in Sydney's city with Greg, who was older by a year and a few months. They had gotten a puppy a few weeks earlier. She was a small Shih Tzu Maltese cross that was extremely healthy and happy. They were in the middle of potty training her and decided since she was old enough to go outside now and she had her vaccinations, it would be a good idea to start taking her out of the front of the apartment building where there was grass where she needed to pee. They had done this for a few weeks now and had gotten used to it. She also enjoyed going out. She loved people. She was the type of dog to bark at everything and everyone. One night, Matt took her out to the grass at around 1 a.m. He noticed straight away that it was eerily quiet. Too quiet considering it was only 1 a.m. and in the center of Sydney City. The puppy had done her business and was just walking around sniffing and barking at the grass. Out of nowhere, a man dressed in all black but nice clothing, came up to Matt. When Matt told Greg this later on, he described the man as expressionless. He felt as though the man could see straight through him. The man knelt down in front of the puppy and looked her in the eye. She all of a sudden stopped barking, laid down, and whimpered at the man's feet. This freaked Matt out, so he picked her up, getting ready to go back upstairs. The man gave Matt a cold smile and left without a word. Matt was of course freaked out, but once telling Greg, they found themselves laughing at what they thought to just be a weird encounter with a weird man. The next day before leaving for the day, they left the puppy food and water, which they would find untouched when they came back in the afternoon. They just thought that maybe she wasn't hungry. But when they went and found her shivering in her bed with vomit and diarrhea around the room, they knew something was wrong with her. They had still not remembered yesterday's weird encounter yet though. They took her to the vet and she got looked at. The vet examined her stomach as they thought she must have eaten something toxic or just bad, which would cause vomiting and diarrhea, right? Well, there was nothing weird about her stomach contents, so the vet checked her urine. They found arsenic in her urine, which gave the vet the diagnosis of arsenic poisoning but they don't know how she got it as she did not ingest any. Matt remembered about the weird encounter and believed that the man, or whatever it was, did something to the puppy. Whether it was the devil or something putting black magic on her, he knew it just had to have had something to do with him. Thankfully, the dog got better after a week or so and lived to about 2010. Matt, Leela, and the rest of their family got another puppy a few years ago, which they still have now, and the dog is also very weird. Even after this incident, Matt is still not super religious or superstitious, and has no clue what he encountered that night, or if it was all just a big coincidence, but he refuses to mess around with anything involved with the devil, black magic, the paranormal, and anything else like that, just in case. He also refused to talk about this to anyone other than Greg, who he already had told. Leela and I don't know why he won't talk about it, but it left that much of an effect on him. I guess it's better not hearing the full thing from his perspective. Now, this might just be a scary story their family throws around when families and friends are over to scare each other, but the way Matt reacts when it's mentioned makes me think otherwise. Neither him or me or you will ever know if this is true or not, but either way, mysterious man potential black magic guy, or the devil himself, leave our dog alone. I 
I am a very, very touchy-feely, sweet type of person and I would always hold hands with my friends, lay my head on their shoulders and would give them warm hugs. There was no malice whatsoever because that's how affectionate I am. This happened during the first major school contest, a school play, during our sophomore year in high school. I was assigned as the head of the props committee and I was given the liberty to choose classmates I wanted to be in the props committee too. Of course, I chose CS, the creepy classmate or stalker, and L, my friend, also my savior, to be in the props because I know guys like them wouldn't want to be a part of the play. Like I said, I'm a very sweet and affectionate person and I felt pity that not many of my classmates were talking to CS because he was the odd one out the class outcast and it was only L who was talking to him because they're seatmates and that's it. So I approached him and befriended him to make him feel less lonely. You know, what a good person would do. And along the span of making props, CS and I got close. Worst thing to have happened, sadly. So one day after classes were done, I stayed a bit later than usual because I was making sure our rival section wasn't going to sabotage our props. Typical high school rivalry, so what do you expect? It was already six in the evening when I left the building and I was walking to the bus stop. And I felt someone walking behind me, so I turned around and along the crowds of college students, there was CS leaning on a pole while looking at his phone. This caught me off guard because he usually leaves the campus on the east gate, not the main gate where I always go, but... I just let it slide and thought maybe he was waiting on L or was just hanging around. We have this open area in the campus which is like a park before you reach the main gate. The next day during lunch I guess I left my bag unzipped because when I got back from the cafeteria there was a brown paper bag inside which I know I didn't bring. Picking it up there was a Hershey's chocolate bar inside and a small note taped on it that says you look so pretty today, Alpaca, which is my name. I really didn't mind the letter because the only thing in my mind is that I got a chocolate bar. Nonetheless, I showed the note to my best friend and L. Both of them had different reactions. My best friend, being the hopeless romantic she is, was beyond happy that I had a secret admirer. L, on the other hand, was, for a lack of a better word, irked. It happened again the next day. Next week, next two weeks, with the messages becoming longer. Your smile is so cute and you're so beautiful. You have a cute laugh and I really like you. Those kinds of stuff. One day, for some reason, the faculty had an emergency meeting, so that meant an hour without class and we were talking. Some had their phones out and my seatmate was sleeping. I was busy doing calligraphy on my journal when I saw a flash of light in my peripheral vision. I looked at the direction where it came from and I saw CS fiddling at his phone or tablet which was undoubtedly angled at me. Again, I let this slide. That's when L walked by and slipped a paper on my lap saying, look at your phone. So I took my phone from my bag, turned it on and L sent a message. I have something to tell you later on, be online. That night at home I was waiting for L to go online when he was, his first message was to avoid CS and stop talking to him. I asked why and he sent pictures of a phone, a gallery to be exact, and I noticed one album with the title, Alpaca. The next photo L sent was the contents of the album. It was pictures of me, pictures from my Facebook, pictures during class, stolen pictures, and some pictures were obviously zoomed in or cropped so there was only my face in the picture. Obviously, I got creeped out and asked L whose phone was that and lo and behold, it was CS's phone. L further then told me the paper bag with the Hershey's and messages were from CS. He knew from the start because of the handwriting and I got creeped out more. L told me to be safe and to start avoiding CS from now on and I did. The next few days I gave the paper bag to L without getting the Hershey's and I think CS was slowly noticing that I was avoiding him. This is where stuff hits the fan. Another day of me leaving school at 6pm because of a school seminar, as usual, I was walking to the main gate when I noticed there weren't many students out for some reason which made the walkway less crowded. 
The next thing I knew, I felt someone behind me, and there was C.S., failing to hide behind a big bush. My red flag was waving, so I called L. and told him that C.S. is behind me and hiding behind a bush. L. frantically told me to walk fast towards the bus stop and stay on the line with him. I tried my best to calm my nerves and walk fast. I would simply look over my shoulder and I could see C.S. keeping up and almost a hundred feet near me, and I think L. picked it up from how I gasped and he told me to run. I ran towards the main gate into the overpass and I hid behind a stall selling street food by the sidewalk. A few minutes later I saw C.S. by the bus stop looking around and was low-key checking if the students by the bus stop wearing our school uniform was me. I was still on call with L and I told him C.S. was looking for me by the bus stop. Fortunately, C.S. left and went back to the overpass but L told me I should go to the bus stop on the next block just to make sure. I got home safely. The following weeks consisted of me avoiding CS like the plague, but I felt his stare at the back of my head. Whenever I look around the classroom and get a glimpse of him, he would have this straight stare and it really freaked me out. L was kind enough to accompany me by the bus stop and sometimes he would distract CS whenever classes are dismissed. The final straw was when C.S. shoved an envelope inside my bag and it was three yellow pad papers. I didn't get to read it because L. took it from me and he read it instead. After reading it, he tore the papers and threw it. I asked him what the letter was about and he told me C.S. thought I loved him because I befriended him and that we were in a relationship and was confused why I was avoiding him. He goes on and on that he loves me and that we were the perfect couple and I was dumbfounded. I backtracked to how I befriended him and how I approached him and I wondered if I let him on, but I know I wasn't. I was just being myself. Push comes to shove and I told CS that I didn't love him nor were we ever in a relationship. The rest of the school year went smooth except for the time CS and I were in a group for a project or activity, but I made sure to keep the conversation short and quick. I had just moved to Oakland from another major city a couple of weeks prior and was very naive about encounters with strangers at the time. I had just returned from my first job interview with the Gig Economy Cycle Courier Company in San Francisco. Sure that I had the job and decided to roll and smoke a celebratory blunt on my 20 minute walk home from the train as I neared my apartment. Shortly after finishing, a huge stranger turned a quick corner off of a side street and walked past me. I heard his Nikes screech to a halt and turn and when I looked back, his friendly handsome face was smiling at me with bright white teeth. He asked if I had another cigarette. Yeah, I've got another one, let me roll you one. I said, smiling back at him. He was very grateful and held a respectful distance as I rolled him a terrible bugler cigarette. After I gave him the square, I told him I was on my way home and had a 15 minute walk before I got there, excusing myself. He offered to come with me to make sure I stayed safe, and I accepted, glad for the company. It wasn't long before he strayed the conversation into some weird waters. Are you a virgin? Nah, I've been around. Are you single now? Yeah, I'm single. Are you into guys at all? Yeah, sometimes. He got really excited when he found out that I was bi and started giving detailed accounts of the things that he had used to have when he was my age. I got pretty uncomfortable at this point and was visibly shaken, but he seemed encouraged and gleeful about my awkwardness. He pressed further. You think I'm sexy? You're really cute, but I'm kind of stoned and just trying to get home. You want to come to my place instead? Hey, I think I just need to get home and sleep in my own bed. At this point, he procured a bag of white powder from his pocket and asked if I liked to roll. I had told him I wasn't interested and I really appreciated it. He kept pushing this for several minutes and then told me, Hey, my aunt's place is coming up and she don't trust strangers. I'm going to run inside and then be right out. Take your shoes off and pretend your ankle is hurting so I have an excuse for my auntie. I'll just tell her you hurt your foot and I'm trying to help you out. 
I felt like he was trying to rob me at this point and was really scared of him. The way he carried himself told me he had years of experience and many pounds of muscle over me. I submitted, taking my shoes off on the sidewalk, still stoned as all get out and knowing I was about to lose my phone, wallet, and shoes only a couple of blocks from my new home. He went up the door and pretended to knock, coming down the steps, grabbing my shoes and telling me forcefully to walk across the street and sit in a closed off alley across the street. At this point I asked him, are you going to rob me? Just take my stuff, I don't, I almost have no money and my phone is worth nothing. But he cut me off and enveloped me in a big hug, grabbing my butt and holding me close enough that it hurt. He broke the hug after a few seconds and said, No, oh, I like you dude, I'm not trying to rob you. When we got to the alley he asked me to sit down on the log and I did. I was scared of him and stoned out of my mind with my low tolerance and felt completely powerless to this huge street smart man. I also noticed a gun shaped bulge in his left hand hoodie pocket which he was eager to touch when there was a lull in conversation. When we got across the street he almost instantly shoved his hands into his pants and began to touch himself his head rolling back on his neck and his eyes almost closed except for watchful pupils keeping an eye on my feet. A few seconds into this, he yelled at me, Hey, take those socks off. Shaking visibly, I pulled my socks off. Softly, Wiggle your toes. Let me see some action. I obliged for about ten minutes. I asked him at one point if he was going to harm me, and he blew me a kiss with his left hand still going to town. No, I would never hurt you, baby. I got you now and forever. Finally, finally he went and this smile transfixed to his face. He pulled it out of his pants and begged me not to tell anybody as he already had a felony for indecent exposure in front of the minor. I told him I wouldn't. He asked for my number and told me he was going to call it right away. I gave him my real one and he did call. He told me he'd see me real soon and smiled, embracing me tightly. He walked away quickly and after that, I put my shoes on and ran. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video and join my discord to interact with me and other listeners directly and if you want to support me even more grab early access to all future narrations for just one dollar a month on patreon and maybe even pick up some let's read merch on spreadshirt links in the bio thank you guys again so 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 much and I'll see you again soon.